Well, welcome to After the Plague, Health and History of Medieval Cambridge. Um, what I want to do is just tell you a little bit about this skeleton. This is an individual who lived in Cambridge, right where we are now, in the 1200s. We don't know exactly when he was born or died, but it was within that century. And um, he lived as one of Cambridge's urban poor. It's a group of people that are very hard to find out about from history because historical records are based around mostly property. And if you didn't have wealth or were taxed, then very often you would not actually show up in the historical records. So this fellow lived and died as part of the urban working class. And when he died, he was living in a charitable home for indigent people and was buried in their cemetery. So um, he represents a, a group of the population we'd never find out about in any other way and find out about how they lived, what they experienced. Let me just tell you about some of the interesting points about his skeleton, what we've learned about him. Um, he was essentially buried in a pauper's grave. It's a very well-preserved skeleton. Um, biologically, it's sexed as male. So for medieval times, he was probably gendered male as well. Um, he died when he was above 40 years old, probably sometime between 40 and 70. So he lived to a good, a good age for medieval people. And um, we know that from various indicators, primarily here in his pelvis. Um, he, he had a, a long and, at some points, quite stressful life. So if we look at different elements on his skeleton, um, if we look close up carefully at his teeth, for example, you can see that he has several fine lines that indicate growth interruptions when he was a small child. Um, we call these enamel hypoplasias. And he recovered from them. He grew to a good size for his period. Um, he was of middle size and slightly above the average for, for the 13th century. Um, he was surprisingly well nourished, and this was a little bit of a paradox we don't quite understand. When we analyzed the carbon and nitrogen isotopes from his skeleton, we found that he had quite an enriched diet that indicated a lot of animal or fish protein. And this is a little bit of a surprise because in general in medieval society, the poorer you were, the more you lived on one form or another of grain, and the less animal protein you ate. So we think either he was eating above his station in some way, or he was buried below his station. We don't know which. But Cambridge had a lot of people who were engaged in one way or another in the food trades as uh, part of serving the university, which had a lot of mouths to feed. And we think he may have been involved with that. And as such, he may have got some of his food by way of business rather than because he was wealthy. One of the basic questions people really want to know is what he looked like. And um, you will have seen the facial reconstructions of him that were done by forensic artists from the University of Dundee. Um, you can see a little bit of the peculiarities in his skeleton now. So for example, if you look at his jawbone, um, he has an extremely flared edge to his jawbone, which would have given him a very wide masculine jaw. At the same time, his forehead is a very gracile one. He doesn't have the brow ridges that are common in robust men and would have looked a little bit feminine, although the side of his and back of his skull show a lot of musculature. So he probably had quite a thick, strong neck that went with having a robust torso. Um, when he grew up, we knew that he had various forms of adult stress in his life. So for example, if you look at his vertebrae, these are all of his vertebrae from his backbone, and quite a lot of them have these small indentations in them, which represent places where the intervertebral discs, which, which are the kind of shock absorbers between the vertebrae, where they herniated and extruded in and came into contact with the vertebral bodies. These are very common and they indicate some form of wear and tear on the spine, some kind of physical stress. He also had a number of fractures, so I'll just point out a few of them. Um, one is on the on his first lumbar vertebra, that's about a, th a third of the way up your lower back. He had a hairline fracture that was caused by some form of shock that fractured a little bit of the bone and it healed up. So it probably would have hurt when he moved his back for a month or two, and then after that it would have been fine. He also had a broken rib. Um, this is a very common fracture. People get a lot of them nowadays. Um, they have to do usually with either taking a blow to the ribs or a fall. And here you can see that it's healed up nicely, leaving a little bit of a fracture callus. But again, no disability, just a bit of pain for a while. And on the top of his skull, on the back of his skull, he has a little depressed fracture here, which represents some kind of a localized blunt force injury. It hasn't penetrated the skull. It hasn't fractured it extensively. It just resulted in probably some concussion and a little bit of a permanent dent in the outer table of the skull. Um, so once again, a kind of injury which resulted in 
pain for a while, but healed up and left him without any substantial disability. In terms of his um, diseases and health, he had a number of conditions. Um, one is something that we can spot, but we can't really diagnose rather frustratingly. That's resulted in very fine new bone deposition on all four of his major lung bones from the leg, the femurs and the tibias. And there's a number of conditions that can result in this. One that's a little bit more concrete is gout, which was a very common medieval disease. And if you look at the heads of his first metatarsals, this is in your foot, just under the ball of your foot where you push off when you walk. He has the beginnings of little concavities, which are a very typical sign of gout. And again, in the medieval period, this was a recognized illness. It was associated sometimes with a rich diet, although not always, and more common in men than women. So in this sense, he's being very typical for his period. Um, it's not a very advanced case as medieval cases go. So just getting started when he died. The other obvious disease he has is quite a lot of dental disease. If you lived in the medieval period to any age at all, you would have lost a lot of teeth. So if you look at his upper jaw, for example, you can see that he's lost four of his upper molars already due to dental disease. The bone is nicely resorbed here, the socket's all filled in. So he lost that considerably before he died. Um, so this would have affected his chewing. He would have been chewing a lot more on his front teeth, for example, than you might if you had all of your molars. Um, he also had an abscess around the root of this tooth. You can just see the channel here where it was draining. And a number of other forms of dental disease, including calculus, um, periodontal disease, and um, car caries or cavities also. So very typical for the medieval period, um, quite a lot of dental illness. And of course, if you can imagine dental illness in an age that was substantially without dental care or anesthesia, this probably would have been fairly painful at times. So he lived a, a good long life. He has a lot of pathology in the skeleton, but that's partly because he's a bit of a survivor. And a lot of the pathology that we see is long-term chronic illness that wouldn't have put him out of action necessarily, but would have caused some pain and left some mark on the skeleton. But he lived in and went beyond it until finally something killed him sometime between 40 and 70 years old. One of the interesting questions about him is how he relates to the people around him. Um, we don't know genetically because we're still running the ancient DNA. We know he has a very common mitochondrial DNA lineage, but all that proves is that he was part of a, of a very widespread gene pool that as far as we know yet, there is nothing very distinguished about his genes or very unusual, which makes sense. That, that's reassuring in a way. Um, one of the interesting facts is that the, his mitochondrial DNA lineage is the only one of its kind in the hospital cemetery among the ones we've looked at so far. And if you think about it, if you're in a cemetery where people are buried with family members, then you'll probably have someone around you who shares some of your DNA. And in a charitable institution for indigent people, then probably you're going to be buried with people that you're not related to. And I think the DNA so far seems to support that picture. Um, in terms of how he compares otherwise, we don't know yet, but we hope to find out because medieval Cambridge probably had 30 or 40 different places where you could be buried as a medieval person. And which one you got buried in wasn't random. It depended on how much money you had, how strongly associated you were with a college or a monastery or a parish, um, what your standing was in life. And in that sense, he's buried in the poor people's cemetery for special charitable cases. One of the things we want to do as, a, as part of our project over the next three years is to look at how these people compare in their health and in their status with people from other cemeteries. So for example, was the diet that these people ate before they were buried in the poor people's cemetery worse or equal to the diet that people buried in more prosperous settings ate? Do their skeletons show more signs of wear and tear and stress and physical labor? Or was everyone leading a physically hard lifestyle then? Uh, so we hope to, to find out more about how his story is typical of all of medieval Cambridge or is typical only of the poorer end of society or whether in fact he had a unique story that marks him out as an individual in some way. And so that's um, yet to be found out and tune in again in a few years.